with youth and inexperience. <laughs> Well, that's not being very fair to her, is it? I mean, here she's a thinking, feeling young woman. Isn't it possible they just fell in love? Oh, please. Woody Allen is not in love with that girl. Listen to you. Not only is it appalling that he did it, but that he doesn't seem to think there's anything wrong with it. That's what's so galling. No moral dilemmas whatsoever. Did you see that in Time magazine? How can he find no moral dilemmas whatsoever? He wasn't looking, so he didn't find any. His girlfriend's daughter? Ex-girlfriend's daughter, adopted daughter. So what? He was still practically a father to her. No, no, no. Her father? It's not the same. Why isn't it? They were together 12 years. What's that girl's life? If not her father, her father figure then. And what about the 25 other kids she's got? No, no. He said he never even looked twice. If, if you know. believe that. Well, maybe it's true. I mean, maybe she was there all along and he suddenly awakened one day to her, uh, her irresistible charms. What? Like Gigi? <laughs> yeah. when, when something like this happens, it's, uh, it's magnetic. It's um, hypnotic. It's irresistible. Well, there's no reason. Reason and morality, they have nothing to do with it. Particularly if you're as naive and impressionable as uh, uh, my lay. The allure of a famous older man. An incredibly powerful thing. Well, that's provocative, Ruth. Well, he's entitled to a private life. Why are you defending him? I'm not defending him. Yes, you are. And I find it very irritating, Ruth. I really am. I want to know why you're getting so worked up about this. It's not about uh, movie stars misbehaving, obviously. I mean, movie stars misbehave all of the time. They always have. It's what they do. It's why we invented them, so they locked out for them. Mm -hmm. It's not about the misbehavior. It's about what it represents. Thank you, Dr. Freud. So what are you saying? I'm still pissed at my father for leaving my mother? Ooh, well, now that you mention it, darling. All right, so... I went over all this the other day with my shrink. A whole session on Woody, Mia, and Daddy Dearest. Can you imagine the impact Woody's little indiscretion is having? People on couches all over Manhattan, moaning to their analysts about it. I couldn't believe the shit that poured out of me. Feelings of rage, betrayal, abandonment. Like I was 12 years old all over again. My father isn't talking to me, by the way. Well, really? Why? I don't know. I gave him the Disneyland story to read. Oh, dear. Yeah, and he hated it. Yeah, well, that's no surprise. He was furious. I never should have written it. No, you didn't. That wasn't just an option. You, you had to write it. Didn't I? Yes. Of course you did. But the question is, why did you have to give it to him to read? It wasn't a very flattering portrait. I know. Okay, so what did you get it from? I don't know. So you have some idea what I'm doing? I mean, he hasn't read my stuff since high school. Well, that Disneyland story is a really tough introduction to your work, don't you think? Yeah, I suppose so. But I didn't want to be secretive about it. That didn't feel right either. I, I thought I was doing the right thing. Yeah, but what, what did you hope to accomplish, huh? Uh, to win his respect? I don't know. His approval? Uh, get him to see what a, what a good little writing you are? I guess so. Yeah. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted his approval. Pretty infantile, huh? Why did you have to give him that particular story? You have other more benign stories you could have given him to read, but yeah. instead you give him that one to go straight for the jugular, and I think that that's very interesting. If I'm going to write what I know, it's inevitably going to hurt people's feelings, isn't it? True. You, you, you can't uh, stifle your creative impulse and, uh, just because you're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings. Even if it's my father's? Even if it is. I mean, if you've got a story to tell, you got to tell it. Uh, zero in on it. Go straight for it. Don't flinch. Question is, why did you have to show him a story he never had to see? Oh? Actually, he would see it. This was sort of a preemptive strike. Oh? It's being published. <laughs> it is? But how did that happen? I thought we heard back from everybody that we sent it to. We had. I also sent it to Grand Street. Grand Street? 
but uh, I thought we decided that wasn't the right kind of journal for it, and uh, yeah, I didn't know anybody. I said to do it anyway, just for the hell of it, and see what happened. <clears throat> huh. Uh, what, well, what about a letter? You didn't ask me to write a letter, did you? I just sent him a cover letter of my own. You know, the basic. The publishing? That's what they said. Well, what do you know about that? It didn't seem like that cup of tea at all. I know. That's what we thought. Ah, isn't that nice? The, you're going to be a published private. I know. Yeah. I can't believe it. Well, uh, what did they do? Uh, call you? Write you? They wrote me. When? The other day. Oh, I've spoken to you every single day this week and I never once heard a word about a letter from Grand Street. I just found out. The other day, you said. I don't remember when did exactly. What difference does it make? Well, I, I, I think it's just very curious. Uh, why didn't you call me immediately? Oh, what, what are you talking about? Why isn't that the first person you called? Maybe you were. You never know. If you bother to get an answering machine, then... <laughs> well, you say you did call me or like you might have called me. I don't understand this. Well, I just think it's very curious. The person most invested in your progress, and you wait till now to tell me. In the most roundabout way, I might add. I'm telling you now. I I told you today. I want to tell you face to face. I thought you said you tried calling me. You're impossible, you know that? Am I? Did you? Did you try calling me? Hmm? Or, or, or was that just a convenient lie? Why would I lie? I just think that you're not being totally upfront with me. I was well, a little funny, I guess, because I submitted it on my own. It's just a little journal. Nobody reads it anyway. Delmore Schwartz. What? I want to hear about you and Delmore Schwartz. What are you talking about? Tell me. I don't know what you're talking about. He was your famous older man, oh, wasn't he? For God's sake. Well, wasn't he, Ruth? How did you get that? It didn't click till just now. When we were talking about wood. No, that's ridiculous. I'm right, aren't I? <laughs> I am! Come on, Ruth. I can tell. Tell me. What do you want from me? I want you to tell me. There's nothing to tell. Ruth. It's really none of your business. All right. <clears throat> I was only trying to get you to talk to me. But if you don't want to tell me. One years ago, another lifetime. I, uh, I was quite young. How young? Twenty-two. Yeah, but a young twenty-two. An innocent in many ways. I was a good girl, a nice Jewish girl, a passionate girl, one of these passionate virginal uh, girls who reads uh, Dickinson and Hopkins and you know sobs her eyes out. Poetry? It was my love, it was my romance, it was my uh, religion. What a time. I'd just come to the city from Detroit to be a poet. And I took a tiny a walk up uh, on Grove Street above an Italian restaurant. The place smelled like garlic. Always. No, it was wonderful. My pillow smelled like garlic, my clothes. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a roommate. Her name was uh, Elaine. She was the only soul I knew in all of New York City. But one sleeping night, Elaine schlepped me to a bar on Hudson Street, uh, the White Horse Tavern. 
and sitting there in the booth, his wide, handsome face shining, his big voice booming for all to hear whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> they are performing for the two pretty poets that sat at his table. Uh, there was the great poet, Delmore Schwartz, mad prophet, on the genius. We sat across the aisle, Elaine and I, and uh, he, he included us in his rantings. I don't know, about DiMaggio one minute, and then, and then Kierkegaard the next. And then after midnight, the, the first team of cheerleaders the grew tired, and they left. So Elaine and I moved our drinks over to his team. See his shining face across the table now. His eyes darting about, gleaming with brilliance. There was so much going on in there. And he was, he was well past his prime at this point. He was sort of gay and he was bloated and he was going to seed. He had an enormous head. But he was quietly spaced eyes. There was still something magnificent about him. You know, He's been quite beautiful once. I know. I've seen pictures. You're only 44. There was something uh, ancient about him. Even then, uh, even that first leading night, he seemed tuned. So, uh, what a sheltered Jewish girl from Detroit. <laughs> What, what self-styled poet, what uh, virgin, <coughs> wouldn't have succumbed. I was pretty then, too. Sure. Uh -huh. you know. see, you've seen pictures. Yes. Not pretty enough, but they're shapely. Anyhow, oh, I look damn good in those tight little coed Lana Turner sweaters. <laughs> I was good company for, for a man like Delmore. Now, being my father's daughter, but it gave me years of practice. I was a good listener. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I had a real mouth on me, too, yeah, which he'd point out frequently with pleasure. You know, I, I, would, I would tease him and I would provoke him, and, and I'd do all sorts of things to get a rise out of him, which I always did. I stuck by him for over a year. He was descending rapidly by then. Uh, Quite mad, you know. And yeah, he had his moments, his uh, lucid, marvelous moments, but uh, oh. one day came. His rampages, oh, they were fiercer and fiercer. His, uh, his aura, his aura sustained him. I would go to his. Uh, awful rented rooms when he was out. You know, the kind with the sordid furnishings and the sink and the, and the hot plate. And I'd clean up the dishes that had piled up for days and, uh, and, and, and mend his clothes and clean his mess. And then, then he'd come in and he'd <laughs> never say a word of thanks. One day I let myself in. There was another bright-eyed girl lovingly washing his socks in the sink. Oh, she said, you're surprised to see me. Well, I, I turned around and I, and I went up and I never went back. <clears throat> you, know, you know the rest of the tale, yeah? How he was in one of those hotel rooms when he died in 66 and how, how his body lay unclaimed in the morgue for days. Poor schmuck! I don't talk about this! Oh, God. Why did you make me talk about this? I'm sorry. It's too painful conjuring up that girl. That affair. I sold that man's trousers. I held him when he woke up in a, in a cold sweat. I took a lot of shit from him in the name of poetry. I didn't 
lot of things I'm not particularly proud of. Look. And yet, oh, it was my shining moment. No, it wasn't. It was. It was. You've never written about him. Yeah. How come? Something you don't touch.